Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I think. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Good that you're here. Can you all hear me? Somebody tells me something. Marsha, maybe. I see the green moving, so yes, great. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Yeah, okay, good. Good that you're all here. Me from the Netherlands and you coming from all over the world. Crazy, isn't it? To be able to connect in this way and then being at our own space, in own place. Oh, great to have you all here. So, as maybe people might still be dropping in, I'm just going to start with today's subject of the webinar. And then along the way, uh, you can ask any question if anything comes up. But first, I will tell you something, and then... Um, Please, if there is anything that you would like to ask, you can always write it in the in the subject or in the messaging, and then I will try my very best to answer all your questions. So today's uh, subject is really about how to be able to functionally teach and to get your students into um, finding their own functional practice, meaning that their the practice that they are doing whether it's a yin practice or a yang practice, that it is functional, that it's working for them, and that they get the benefits of the poses for what they are doing. And whether it's the asanas or the actual meditation pose they do, that um, is still something that you want to offer. So how can you guide the people in a functional way that so that they start to explore and and, and experiment a little bit with the poses that you are that you are offering. And this is sometimes very difficult because we are so still oriented into a visual or into um, yeah in, in copying certain poses like how the teacher does it, how he or she shows it. and we're still identifying with the visual that we are um, getting in front of us because it's, still difficult for a lot of people to actually go inside and feel and then at the same time to have the guidance of the teacher that allows them to feel whether or not they are feeling what the pose is supposed to do for them. So it goes both ways. First of all, it starts with the teacher that you are able to give um, cues that the person who is practicing it knows what the pose is for. So you need to be very clear on, okay, this is what the pose is for, whether it's creating a wanted stretch in a certain area or maybe creating a wanted um, strengthening in a certain area, or maybe it is supposed to compress a certain area, meaning that two parts need to come together, for example, in the lower back, and that that is a wanted compression. It's a function of a pose. And then you need to be able to say as a teacher also what it is that people should not experience. So it first of all starts with the teacher. If you are able to guide or tell the students when you are guiding them into the pose, what the pose is for and what it should give you and what it should not give you, that's where it starts. And then the second step is for the student to experience, oh, or to explore, is that what I'm feeling? Is that what I'm experiencing? Then no, okay, then what should I do? So when um, students that are doing a teacher training, for example, ask me like, oh yeah, you know, I find it really hard for people to start to experiment and to play with the poses in order to find their stimulation of the pose. So what I then advise them is you have like different ways of going about it. So the first one being that your cues are impeccable, that you're giving uh, the cues saying, okay, for example, in a yin pose, let's say um, seal pose, you want to experience an opening in the chest and in the belly, and you want to feel a doable compression in the lower back. 
Likewise, for a yang pose, which might be bridge pose, you want to experience an opening in the front of the hips, in the belly, and in the chest. And you want to feel a doable compression in the lower back. And what you want to activate, so the yang part of it, is that you're activating the muscles of your back, the buttocks, and the hamstring area. So that, those are the things that you need to tell them. Then what you don't want to experience in a pose is that you don't want to feel a painful sensation in the example of these two poses in the lower back, for example. So then if you do experience that, then you need to adjust the pose. So you can give then as a teacher um, a variation of what you could do. For example, broaden the legs wider and then see if you still feel the amount of pressure in the low back. And this can work for both poses, yeah, for both yin and yang. But this is a lot of talking already. So how I would do it when I teach, for example, the bridge pose is that, okay, we're going to go into the pose, bend the knees, place your feet on the floor, and then lift your hips up. If you feel that in your lower back there is a sharp sensation and you're not able to go higher and you do not feel a stretch in the front of the body, but you do feel your buttocks working, then try to adapt or to widen the legs a bit and maybe that helps to go higher and at the same time strengthen the glutes, hamstrings and back muscles. Yeah. So this is actually guiding them like what it is that you're supposed to feel or what you should not feel. But then still students find it difficult to follow that and then to say, to, to explore, oh, is that what I'm feeling? So I've noticed in teaching that that might not always be the best way. So then what I do is put everyone through various variations. So for example, in bridge pose, I would say, okay, let's all start with the feet parallel on the floor, knees are up. And then you press into the feet and then you lift your hips up. How does that feel in the lower back? How does it feel for your buttocks and your hamstrings and your back muscles? Do you feel them engaged? And do you feel an opening in the front of the torso, the belly, and the hips? Okay, so remember that, then go down. Now widen the legs a bit, and then again, go up with the hips to see and experience how that feels in the lower back, the strengthening of your muscles, and the opening on the front. Okay, then lower down again. Now turn the feet out while you still have the feet apart and then go up and then the same. And then go down again. And then I give the option to the students to choose one of these three variations so that they're able to experience, they were, when I guided every one of the group through these variations, so they were able to feel actually, hey, what was the effect of one variation, of the second variation, of the third variation? And then I give them the choice. You can now go for the choice that allowed you to get most height, most opening, and a good work for your glutes, hamstrings, and back muscles without any pain in the lower back. So that can help sometimes to help the students experiment, help the students to play a little bit with their body and to let go of like, oh, this is the way to go with the pose. So to be able to let go of that. And also with that way, you give the students not the, the feeling that they are special because I've guided them through all of the variations, the whole group, and then the whole group has to do those variations and then you can choose. Yeah. So then people are not so prone to look around and to compare. Whereas that might be the case when you say, okay, so you give the responsibility to the student to play, which can also be an option, you know, to say, okay, when you're feeling painful compression, you could bring the feet apart, but then you put the respons responsibility with the students themselves. And then when they're not so used to playing and they're still kind of stuck in this ideal, like, oh, I have to perform it in the same way as the others do or the teacher does, that they don't dare to play. So this could be something to help them out. And this could be a way of guiding of like how to kind of have them experience the differences and then to have them choose to do it so that they practice in a way the pose that it is becomes beneficial for them and they get out of the pose what they need to get out of it. So that is the thing that I wanted to focus on first. And then another thing that I wanted to say is like, okay, um, I wrote it down here to see. Yeah. So 
what you can also do is, for example, give yourself as a teacher, um, as an example, you know, we are also human beings. We also have our skeleton and our limitations. Um, so if you notice that you have a hard time uh, performing a certain pose, whether it's yin or yang, and you found out that it's due to skeletal variation, that's, that's the reason why you cannot make that shape as it is depicted in a picture maybe, then you can give yourself as an example. What you gain with that is, first of all, you, you get personal, you make it personal. People see that, oh, the teacher has also difficulties in performing the picture or the, the pose as the picture. Um, but the, the second gained thing is that you right away educate people that we're not the same, that our bodies are different, that we ha don't have the same skeleton, we don't have the same abilities of moving. If it's tension, you can explain, then it's something that you can work on. And that will certainly change whether you do yin or yang style of yoga. But if it's a skeletal thing that doesn't allow you to make a certain movement, then you it will not change with time. So then you will experience painful compression or unwanted tension that is created somewhere. So then you can say, okay, I've tried this for years. It doesn't change, so I need to adapt this pose to be able to feel it in, for example, the hamstrings. Um, I've given in previous webinars as well the example of caterpillar or uh, Paschimottanasana. In my body and the way my hip sockets are placed, I cannot um, move forward and hit with my belly onto my thighs. I will always be rounding my back, yeah? The moment if I abduct my legs, so in dragonfly, and I can't remember now the, the name for it in yang poses. Well, anyway, with your legs abducted and then going forward, I can go almost all the way flat onto the floor with my belly um, and then feel the stretch in my inner thighs. So there, my pelvis is not stopped by my legs. So I use that example also when I'm teaching uh, caterpillar or Paschimottanasana, I don't feel in Paschimottanasana the effect in my hamstrings and which is the function of the pose. I just feel it in my back, which is also a function of the pose. So it is also important as a teacher to bring across that sometimes a pose has a function, like for example, Paschimottanasana, to target the back part of your legs and to target the, the spine. But if you don't feel it there or you just feel it in just the spine or the hamstrings, then you can use the pose for that. Yeah. Because that is what the pose is giving to your body right now. And then, um, for example, in, in my case, I need to do a different pose to be able to target my hamstrings. And that is most of the time, just one leg variation of a pose. Yeah. To be able to get into my hamstrings. So that is also bringing awareness to the students that they have to understand that not everyone has to be able to do all the poses, the yin or the yang poses. That's not the goal. The goal is actually use the poses that are there, yin or yang, to be able so that you can target your body, open up, strengthen your body in a way that is beneficial for you. And not to have the goal for the poses, but the goal is you, your body, your experience, what you are feeling and if it's working for you. And then you don't actually have to get into like, oh, can you do this pose already? You might wanna, you might think it's fun to be able to do a certain pose, think of a, a handstand without using the wall, but you have to have the, the flexion for it. If you're lifting your arm up and you're feeling pain here on the top of your shoulder, you're just gonna be suffering in your handstand, even though you would to do it. So then the question arises, okay, why do you do the poses that you do? So I think it's very important as a teacher to educate the students to say, okay, you know, we're going to do these poses with this goal. If you're not getting that, you can adapt the pose. And if that is not working, then maybe we should offer a different pose that has the same functions so that you can get the benefits from it. So you have to have as a teacher really well in mind, okay, what is each pose that I'm offering? What does it do? 
And how can everybody benefit from this? And maybe it is not through adapting that pose. Maybe it's giving a different pose that targets the same area. Also, you have to know as a teacher, the areas where pain can occur. So um, in my 30 hour, 50 hour, and also the yin and, adjustment, yin and yang adjustment course, I talk about all the time, okay, compression, which is skeletal, depending on the shape of your bones, that determines um, if you are experiencing compression or not. And compression is always occurring when two parts are coming together. On the opposite side of the joint, there will be tension. If it's tensed in this area, then you will feel tension in the tissue. Therefore, you might experience a stretch. Yeah, But if that is not stopping you, it, too much stretch, and it's the compression that is stopping you, then you have to go around it by adjusting the movement of the arm in this case. Yeah, so it is very important as a teacher to know what it is that you're teaching, what is the function, what are possible areas where you where students can experience painful sensation or unwanted sensation, and then think of variations for that. And variations for that is always playing with the body or experimenting with the body position of the arms, legs, torso, head, depends per person. So that is why it is so important for people to experience, oh, if I do just a little bit movement more like this, then maybe the whole experience of what they're doing is changed. So we need to open up their minds to be able to uh, practice in that way or to start to practice in that way more from feeling instead of focusing externally on what is shown. So more focusing internally on what is the pose doing for you. Um, yeah, so I've said that. <clears throat> and then also what is very important, what I noticed in, in trainings is to be specific. Yeah, so it is very helpful if you offer a variation for a pose, that you tell them or link it to the reason why you're offering this variation. Because you can give endless variations to people and that uh, it, and it might not, the, the variation might not be there. Or they're just trying it out and they don't know why are they doing these variations. So um, if you say, for example, in the example again of bridge pose and seal pose or even wheel pose, you could have uh, the same experience. If you there offer a variation like, oh, maybe widen the legs, yeah, a little bit, then link it to the problem. So to avoid feeling painful pressure in the lower back, because compression I don't use so much in a regular class, because if you don't know what that is, a student doesn't really understand. So if you, but if you say sharp and stinging pressure in the lower back, they immediately relate to it if that is what they feel. So I say, okay, so if you feel painful sensation in the lower back, you could try to abduct the legs, yeah? Or to take the legs wider and see if then the sensation disappears or turn the feet in or turn the feet out which creates internal external rotation in the legs. We know that as a teacher, you don't have to say that in class, but that will um, have an influence on the amount of pressure that they experience in the lower back. Yeah, so that could be something that you say um, when you're giving an adjustment. So make it concrete. First, okay, this is what you don't want to feel, and then why do you, so, and then link it to the variation that you're offering so that also your student understands why you're giving these variations. Yeah. And then the last thing, yeah, is communication with your students. So mm, I like to communicate with my students in my classes because I want to know what it is that they're feeling. So I go about it two ways. I let them experience the feeling and then have them choose. Or when uh, I have done that and there are still some people who need some specific attention, I go there and I ask them, hey, do you feel any painful sensation? Yeah, I feel it in my lower back. Okay. Do you feel any opening in the front of the body? Because I know that is the function that I want to aim for. Yeah. 
apart from strengthening the glutes and the hamstrings in the bridge pose. And then they say, oh, no, I don't feel so much opening. But they just feel the compression in the lower back. So then I know, okay, they cannot go high enough because of the skeletal compression in the lower back, because that's occurring in the spine. So I need to find a way so that they can go higher and then maybe feel an opening in the front. So then I start playing with their legs in order to feel that. So And then when they have adjusted their position with the legs, I check again. Do you feel still a, a painful compression or a sensation in the lower back? And they say, no. Do you feel opening now in the front? And they say, yes, Look, hopefully. <laughs> and then I say, okay, do you feel your buttock muscles being activated right now? Yeah. So, okay, then you're getting the benefits and then I go. So it's really important also to have concrete questions when you're actually working with somebody one-on-one -on -one to adjust their poses so that they experience the benefit of the, of the pose. Yeah. Because if you say, for example, oh, what is it that you feel? And sometimes people don't know what they feel. So they start thinking and the time ticks away and you don't have so much time to be able to just give one-on-one -on -one attention. So it is very important then to have a short question that they can easily answer and then you can already help them out. So that is also very important. Um, and another thing of one-on-one -on -one adjustments is that you need to listen. As a teacher, we really would like to help them and we want to help them fast. So the pitfall of that can be that when you are helping them, you're not really listening to what it is that they're saying. You're just already filling in what might be what it is that they are feeling or experiencing. So it is also a practice of being present and to really hear what it is that the student says so that from there you can work and not just go on in your own story and then from there give adjustments and that this person thinks, hmm, you're first of all, you're not listening or this is not working what you're giving me. So it is very important to be aware and in the moment and to listen without any uh, interference of your own input or relating to your own body. So that is also very important. Are there any questions or any things that you come across when you are teaching uh, in a functional way and um, you don't know what to do or what to give them? Let me check because I can go. Not yet. So it might take some time. Another thing that I thought of that can come across is when teaching is, for example, that a student in yin, for example, doesn't is not able to stay still. So it might be for a couple of reasons that they're not being able to relax enough or um, that uh, that they... Um, are in too deep, yeah, in the pose. So then what you could do is um, just in general give the option to say, okay, if you're feeling too much and you're not able to relax, then come out of the pose a bit and create some support. You know? Or in, in practice, it is very difficult to stay still for a lot of people. It is also um, trusting the process and trusting in your student that is important so that you don't right away from the start, try to push them uh, into something, into quieting down. Just trust the practice that that eventually will do the work for them also. Let me see if there are some questions. Um, Nicola, I have my own variations for Warrior One, but wondered what you suggest. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, there are a lot of uh, variations for warrior one. It depends also on what you're coming across when you're doing warrior one. So Nicola, could you be a little bit more specific? Because it depends on the body's possibilities, what kind of suggestions I can give. Uh, Jolie, can you tell me some adjustments for the downward dog? 
Okay, that's the same answer actually. Um, okay, so let's go into the warrior one and then right away into the downward dog first. If you're doing what warrior one, first of all, the functions of warrior one are to strengthen your quads to open up the hip flexor area of the leg that goes back. And um, of course, the, the strengthening of the legs. So I'm not sure. If you're gonna, yeah. So warrior one. Yeah, you don't see it. So I have to push your, you back a bit. Yeah. So warrior one. So apart from the strengthening of the legs and the opening here on the front of the hip, that uh, from the leg that goes back, that is the function of the pose. And also you wanna um, engage the pelvic floor. But for the legs, that is mainly what the function is. So for some people with the leg back, the first problem might occur in the ankle. People are not able to put the foot forward because they lack the flexion for it in the ankle. Then and another option or another possibility of trouble can give you is that the moment you put your leg back, people experience a pressure in the lower back here. So therefore, their hips want to turn out, and this has to do with the position of your hip, uh, your hip sockets. So you can say for the ankle, okay, I turn my feet, my foot out a bit so that there's less angle asked from my ankle. Yeah, you can even put your foot not directly behind the front foot, but a little bit. Or you can say, okay, for the people who have the compression in the lower back and cannot keep their hips square to the front, to um, allow the heel to come off the floor and do it like a lunge position. So that would be warrior one. Then the downward facing dog, more more things come up there. So when you're doing downward facing dog, also you have to deal with the ankle flexion possibility. So some people are not able to bring their heels down. They look like this. So then it's important for a teacher to know, are they feeling a stretch here? And is it so much that for that reason, they cannot bring their heels down to the floor? Or is it because they, they lack the angle for it? So then you could say, okay, if that ladder is the case, walk forward more, make the downward dog narrower so that there's less angle asked from the uh, ankle. And then feel, say if they feel or ask if they feel a stretch in the back part of the legs. Yeah. For the arms and the shoulders, people always say, okay, put the fingers pointing to the front. But then it all depends on what, how that affects the shoulders here on the top. So if people feel and experience compression on the top, so it creates this, for example, then you can say, okay, let's see if you know that it's pressure there or unwanted tension that is created there. There can be because there's compression in the shoulder joint. So what you can do is maybe widen the arms, turn the hands out even, and see if that helps them to bring the shoulders away from the ears to avoid getting that sensation on the top of the shoulder. And then they can actually work with the muscles of the back to pull the shoulder blades down. And you get strengthening of the arms. So that is that you could do, but again, it is different situation for everyone, depending on what the problem is per person when they are doing these poses. Um, then yoga, my energy. When teaching a large class, I found it very hard to do much, so much talking and explaining to give many options. Yeah, I understand. It depends also on what kind of class you were teaching. Were you teaching a yin class or yang class? And it's actually a good question because it makes me think about you should not give like endless variations because you just have to stick to the most present ones that are needed in the moment. So when you are teaching, it is very important while you're guiding people through the poses or into the pose 
that you have a that you have your eye on the students. So like how do they react? What trouble comes up when they are moving? So for example, mm, if you're teaching a young class and you see that people are doing their uh, downward dog like this, then you could say already, okay, so you feel on the top of the shoulder pressure, widen the legs, yeah, or the, <laughs> the arms, and then feel how that feels, yeah? So you could give already variations according to what it is that you observe. Instead of just by heart, uh, giving all kinds of variations and endlessly talking, because then it will tire you out a lot. So keep it relevant what it is that you say and when you say it. No, don't just blur all your knowledge out. Just kind of make it relevant to the moment in that moment. So then you don't have to say so much. I don't know if you told me later on if it was a yin or yang class, but... Mm. Emma. Hello, Emma. Safe ways to offer differences to downward dog relating to the shoulder pain. Yeah, exactly. So I hope that you... Um, that I've given my answer to that uh, question before with my uh, explaining the downward facing dog. Mm, and again, what is the shoulder pain? I mean, if somebody has tendinitis or, um, you know, a frozen shoulder, if they have actually an injury there, then of course the whole adaption of downward facing dog changes. Then I think if you're having an injury that you should not irritate it more it first should heal and you have to you take have to take rest before you can again practice those poses um but if it's shoulder pain due to compression then you can play around with the hand position like i explain also in the adjustment course yin and yang poses um how to go about that yeah so i gave already some possibilities but in that course you can see various people different bodies, so how everybody does their downward dog differently. So you might get some ideas as well there. But the main thing is you should play with your arm and hand position to find a way into practicing a downward dog without feeling that pain in the shoulder. Thinking of time restraint in vinyasa style class is it possible to address many students at once. Tomya. Yeah. I believe so, but because in a vinyasa class, it goes faster, your cues have to be impeccable. So um, you can still say that. You can say, okay, if you're doing, for example, a sun salutation, you want to um, start in Tadasana and you say, okay, lift your arms up. But if you feel the, the pain on the top of the shoulders, you can widen the arms. Inhale here, and you can take an extra inhale for the first two rounds, for example. And then in the last couple of rounds, that if you want to do a sun salutation, you, you just have to repeat the things without explaining a little bit more that you've set uh, as giving an adjustment. So inhaling, widen the arms if you feel the top of the shoulders. Then fall forward. You can turn your feet in or out or separate the feet to be able to feel something in the hamstrings if you're doing Uttanasana. Yeah, and then inhale, lengthen the spine, and you step back in a downward facing dog. If you feel that your heels are not touching the floor and you don't feel stretch in the back of your legs, then you can step forward a bit and then see if you can get into the hamstrings. Yeah, breathe in here, exhale, then go into plank, for example. Yeah, and then you say, okay, widen the legs bit and the ha hands a bit to be able to go down in chaturanga we don't want to feel it on the front but you really want to retract the shoulder blades and then go down then inhale upward facing dog if you feel here the pressure in the lower back abduct the legs or widen the legs keep the legs strong open the chest maybe your hands need to turn out and exhale down etc etc so you have to find a way into how can you give functional cues, so functional meaning what the pose is meant to do for you, and then maybe give an adjustment if they don't feel something. So what I do if I would teach a vinyasa class, 
go slow in the beginning. And then when people get it, when they have their variation of how to do certain poses, especially if you have a flow going on, then um, I go slow in the beginning. And then after a while, when they get it, you can go faster in a flow. And they will do their variation because they have experienced that that is better for their body. Uh, Nicola. Oh, right. Yeah. Worry one. So a lot of people complain about the back knee hurting. I suggest moving their feet more on tracks hip width and play around with the position of the foot. Exactly, Nicola. That is good. Because in warrior one, if the heel goes down, but you want to turn the hip forward, but the foot stays there, then the rotation is asked from the knee. And this is what It cannot rotate in extension when it's straight. It can only rotate when it's bent. So, of course, when the foot needs to stay there and the pelvis needs to push forward and you're not allowed to move the foot, then it will reflect in the knee. So the options that I gave before is, for example, put the foot more out, turn the foot out, or lift the heel up and then turn from the hip. So it's either allowing the foot position to change or the hip position to change. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are there a shoulder? Uh, yoga my energy. Uh, are the shoulder in protraction position? When opening them, wide and down dog position. Sorry, I don't understand what you mean. Protraction is this. In down dog, you're not protracting, you're retracting because you're taking your shoulder blades together and down. I don't, I don't understand the, the question. Sorry, can you explain a bit more? S. Franken, if people have arthros osteoarthritis in the toes, would you let them do a toe squat? Hmm. Um, no, the same concepts apply there. If there is a sharp sensation experienced in the joint, so they're doing this movement and they really feel an excruciating pain here and they're not benefiting from the pose that they feel a stretch at the back of the toes or even the sole of the foot, then it has no sense doing it. Sometimes it can help, you know, just by pulling on the toe that they get into the stretch area and not in the, in the compression. You have to try. You have to see with them to see if, that, if it's doable, but if they keep on feeling the painful sensation in the joint because of the compression, then it's not going to change. That is going to aggravate it more and actually end up having more problems there. So... Um, communicate with your students, see if they can get the stretch in the sole of their foot or in, in their toes. If not, then this that is not a possibility for them to do. So trying with different options, uh, toes, I mean, the toe squat you can do with sitting on top of your heels, but stretching the sole of your foot by holding the toes, that can actually help sometimes because you don't have all the weight on top of the toes and you can regulate it more like this. Hmm. Vanessa, hey, you say, what think I? You know, suppose if we're doing that, I Okay, uh, Vanessa is asking me a question in Dutch. <laughs> She's asking me, um, what do you think in yin classes? Uh, first show the pose and then come out and look around and maybe give adjustments uh, or also to stay in the pose yourself. Well, in my experience, it is when you stay in the pose yourself, you are more with yourself and not with your students. And I believe that when you teach yoga, you are there for your students and not for yourself. So the the goal always is is 
ask yourself, what is that I'm doing or what I'm saying? Is that um, helpful for the student or uh, do they understand it better? Or um, do they feel that I can help them find their position? If that's the case, then don't do that, what you're doing, or don't say that, what you're saying. You them can say, okay, uh, when I teach online classes, for example, live online classes, and I say, okay, come on to your all fours, and I do it with them. And then, uh, for example, uh, circling the arms around. I do it, but at the same time, I keep my eyes on the students to see if, may, may, because we're circling the arms, so then I want to see if anybody has a, an effect on the shoulder. If they're just circling their arms like this and their elbow bends, then I know that probably they don't feel, um, or they feel a painful sensation there. So then what I say is, okay, if, if, if it's painful to circle around, then maybe uh, make the circle less big and then see if you can make that movement. And if you experience any sharp sensation in the shoulder, then don't go there or don't uh, come close to that area. Just kind of move away from that. So it is important to see how your students react to the cues that you're giving. So um, if your aim is, for example, you want to show how a certain adjustment is done, for example, with um, uh, the, the candle, Sirsasana, for example, or uh, even in snail pose, in a yin pose, or which is a yin pose, then people can feel like uh, a lot of pressure on their head, even headaches, or they cannot breathe, which is an inversion. You go upside down. And maybe then you want to show like how you can use the blankets to be able to, um, so that they are able to do the poses. So then, yes, you can take your time and draw the attention. It's is done, but not just practice and do the pose and not have see what the students do. That is always a pitfall. What can happen if you practice yourself? Because then you don't know what is happening with your students or how they react to your uh, cues or how they react in the pose, so that you can not write a, give a variation for it. So you can show but keep an eye on your students. If that's too much to ask, then just guide them verbally into the pose and then um, see how that goes. Okay. Yoga my energy, you mentioned before when there were pain in the shoulders to take the hands wide open to avoid pain in a downward dog position. I guess the shoulders will still be in retraction position. Yeah, because you can, the moment you can bring the shoulders down, then you will use the muscles that retract the shoulder blades and move them away from, from the shoulders. So yeah, it doesn't inhibit that possibility. Not for everyone, maybe yes, but then you reposition the hands and the arms again so that that is uh, something that they still can do. Also for other, great, good, Franken, Sarah. Are there any backbends you would suggest are safe for curved scoliosis? Huh, that's interesting because I just uh, filmed for Eckerd Yoga a, a talk on scoliosis and also I made a practice for that. So um, scoliosis, the curvature is different for all the people who have scoliosis. You also have scoliosis type that is muscular and that therefore the, the, there is a deformity. But then when you fold forward and the spine is not making this S, then it is not a scoliosis from the bone. So if it's from the bone, again, the same uh, concepts apply that if people feel painful compression in the spine in this case, so with scoliosis, the curves can go anywhere. So whether it's a forward bend, a backward bend, a rotation, or a lateral bend, you always need to know uh, if this person doesn't feel any 
sharp stinging sensation in the spine. So no painful compression there. Yeah, so a back bend, it depends all on the curvature. So you always also have to communicate with your students. So you can say, okay, the back bend, you need to go straight back. But maybe the curvature is in such a way that going straight back actually creates compression. So you can also move the torso a little bit to the side and then go back. And maybe then the compression is not experienced in the lower back as much as when they would go back straight, if you know what, if you understand what I mean. Also, not going too deep, so not going to the point of the compression where it's painful. Yeah, just kind of go there. And remember, the function of doing a back bend is first of all to create doable compression in the lower back, and secondly, to create an opening in the front of the torso. So if that is, if they feel an opening in the front of the torso and they feel a doable compression, which actually is for everyone the case in the lower back, then it's good. If they feel painful compression, they should adapt the position maybe by or moving to the side to not feel that painful compression. So it's not just for the back bend. It's the same for the lateral bend. It's the same for the forward bend. It's the same for a twist. Mm, okay, so I hope that helps, Sarah. <laughs> Super, uh, Vanessa, that you so do. Great that you're doing that way, Vanessa. Uh, the sound somewhat sometimes disappears. Ooh, maybe when I'm moving. Mm. Okay, it's on, so it should be working. Thanks for the useful tips. Great, thank you. I only practice teach warrior one with the back heel off the ground and the back foot toes positioning forward. One of the options you demonstrated. Super. As long as it strengthens your legs and uh, you feel an opening in the front of the hip of the leg that goes back, then great. Uh, I heard the other options are not great for the SI joint. Are there any conditions where this variation with the heel off the ground might not be beneficial? Again, uh, I'm not a fan of saying, okay, if you do this, then it's not good for your SI joint because everybody is different. So what is good for someone is not good for another. And what is not good for another is very great for the other. So, you never know. You have to stick to the person and ask what it is that they are experiencing. So if they are doing warrior one and they feel compression all the way up in the lower back or even in the SI joint, then you need to adapt the pose. Then you need to adapt the position of your back leg so that this person doesn't experience it there anymore. And you can even uh, guide people when you guide them through the warrior one, say, okay, we do not want to feel a sharp sensation in the lower back or in the SI joint area. We want to feel an opening in the right, in the hip of the leg that goes back and strengthening of the legs. And then you can say, okay, if you feel pain in the SI joint in the lower back, we need to adapt the pose. So I, I don't believe that it's um, not good for the SI joint, like I said. What is good for one is good for the other and vice versa. Uh, Angela, very refreshing advice for any teacher new old. Thank you. Great. You're welcome. And Claudia, toe squat is really bad for my arthrosis toe, but doing plank is good. Just push the top of the toes in the mat and keep moving back and forth. Wow. So what you're doing, Claudia, is you put the toes, you put the toes on the top. So you don't do it like this. Oh. But you do it like this. Huh, super. I never thought of that, but it's logical. So yeah, great that you share that with us. Super. Then Sarah, from what you just said. Would you adjust the hip position pelvis to the side rather than forward in warrior one? If there is pain 
in someone with skeletal scoliosis. <clears throat> oh, no, I, I would just try. Um, if somebody has scoliosis, again, the curvature can be very different. Uh, it, they're not the same with people who have scoliosis. So again, everybody is different. Every body <laughs> is also different. So um, you would have to check with them to see what works to adjust the warrior one pose. Does it work for them to play with the foot position? Does it work or, or the leg position? Or does it work to play with the pelvis position? So it, it depends really. Again, that, that's why I said you need to communicate with your students if they need that special attention, like you're saying with scoliosis, you need to communicate with them to be able to know what it is they feel so that you can give them the right adjustment. We don't know from looking at them what it is that they experience. So especially in a one-on-one -on -one situation where you have somebody who has specific issues like scoliosis, then you need to ask like, hey, if you put the foot there, is then the sensation in the lower back diminished? No. Okay. Maybe put the foot like this. Is it now diminished? A mm, bit better. Not so much. Okay. Now let's turn the hip forward and lift the back heel. So you have the lunge position. Does that feel better for your back? Oh yeah. Yeah. Do you feel an opening in the front of the hip? Oh yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Great. So this is then your variation. Yeah. So always communicate with them. But that has to fit also with your way of teaching. I like that because that way uh, I can help the people and um, and it never becomes boring. It always and it's not the goal that it becomes boring or some but some students tell me like, oh, you know what what can you do with the sequencing or something like this? And I said, well, you know, you can sequence endlessly, even though using the same poses, uh, if you have a different theme, you can dedicate it to something uh, different, even though you use the similar poses, but with a different aim. But what may really makes it always interesting is that you have people there and they're all unique and all different. So it is just the puzzle of being able to offer something that works for those people and that that's never the same. I, in all my years of teaching and working with people, it is still, I'm still learning like how, like um, the other lady just said who had the atrocious, uh, Claudia, who said to Franklin that she's doing the plank pose on the top of her toes. And I think that's great. That's something that I've never uh, thought of. And so you see, that's that's also the beauty of when you work together with students and they start to feel their body and they start to experiment and then they find their way and you're like, wow, you know, it's not you as a teacher who has all the responsibility to give it to them. Actually, you empower your student to and with the tools and the knowledge so that they know what the pose is for and what they should not feel and how they then can experiment with their body to avoid that. And then maybe they think of something that helps them that you would have never thought of. So it becomes a working together instead of you being the teacher knowing it all. It just puts you on the same place. And then it has more advantages because you're not then coming into any ego trap or, you know, being the perfect person, which we're not. We're all on a journey. So it is just uh, very important, I find, to be able to communicate with people and to also tell them, if you cannot think of a variation, just be honest and say, oh, I cannot really think of something right now that you could do. In that case, give them something else to do because otherwise they would just be sitting and waiting until the rest is done. Mm. But yeah, you know, just be honest. And um, But your will willingness of helping and trying to help them find their way of practicing is there. So... Mm, I hope that helps, Sarah. <laughs> um, one of my students has a C scoliosis, and I was told by her doctor not to do any twists, not to argue with the doctor, but I was thought that 
mild twits with correct breathing are beneficial. Yeah, this Mina, that's actually the point that I just made. Communicate with her. You know, if your student is willing to try and then you just kind of go on a journey together to say, okay, let's try a gentle twist and let's see if that how that feels, because that is always the most important thing. You can say, okay, you have a C scoliosis, therefore you cannot, but it can be that this person really benefits from a twist because it gives her great release. So um, I would experiment and um, tell your student also like, oh, do you want or ask her or him if they want to go on that experimentation with you to see if, they can find release, first of all, from the twist without creating any um, unwanted effects. Claudia. Oh, almost not quite so far on the very top. Okay, I keep pushing the toes down. Okay, Claudia. Well, you know, as long as it doesn't make the pain in the in the toe joint worse then for sure you can do that but if you notice after the practice that you feel your toes again then you might have to revisit uh the way you are doing it mm. the sima any thoughts please the sima did you say anything the sima <laughs> that i did not answer any thoughts please on what <laughs> Sarah, makes sense, thank you. In just starting one-on-one -on -one with someone with an S-curve and the information out there is confusing. Yeah, some says avoid backbends altogether, but I prefer your approach, thank you. You're welcome. Great, Sarah. <laughs> I love it too. Honest communication, yes, it certainly is. Good, Decima. Thanks. All right. Well, I can, you know, we can endlessly talk about this um, for hours and hours, but um, uh, that's why we have these webinars, but we also have uh, uh, quarterly Q&As. If you are signed up for the 30-hour, 50-hour yin modules or the yin uh, and yang adjusting course. So, and that is a Zoom um encounter and then i can actually see you and then we can um do a bit more because then i can communicate directly with you and see how your body moves so then i can help you even better with um finding certain adjustments but um yeah so that's integrated in there so if you have your interest oh pigeon pose Seems very hard to do for some students. Feel the function on the side of the hips. They just tied and experienced pain in the knee and hip joint. Would double knees bend to come forward? Well, pitch and pose, it all has to do with the rotation possibility of the student. So if this student doesn't have enough external rotation, which is this, what I'm doing right now, then uh, the, because the movement is stopped here and the foot is on the floor, then it, they will feel it in the knee. So what you can do is not stay focused on keeping the hips in the center and moving forward, but to allow them to have less external rotation and that you can get by bringing the hip down onto the floor. And then it's safe to move the foot up and down, because then you're just doing this movement with the knee. If you're forcing the foot forward while you're keeping the hips in the center, then you, you ask rotation of the knee that it cannot do. So you safely can move your foot up and down with the hip on the floor, and then keeping the hip on the floor while bending forward can actually give them a stimulation in the, the glute area, the hip area, without feeling it in the knee. So um, that is important. But also this comes up extensively in the online courses that I have. 
Um, so, Masha, can you let them know if there is any um, any gift here after watching this webinar? Can you put that in the messaging? Because that would be nice for them to know, I think. Okay, super. You got my energy. <laughs> All right. So lovely people, um, I have to leave it here. It, ha it has been already one hour. But like I said, if you're very much interested in the functional practicing or teaching or learning to teach in a functional way, um, at Eckhart Academy, Academy, we have various uh, courses on that. And um, three of them I made together with Eckerd Academy. So that would be the Yin Anatomy course, which is 50 hours, the Yin Meridian course, which is 30 hours, and the latest one being adapting a Yin and Yang poses in a functional way. So that is specifically uh, focused on uh, adapting the poses in a way that is beneficial for you. So um, hope to see you there or otherwise another time. And... Uh, Thanks for joining. <laughs> Thank you, Yoga My Energy. Thank you. <laughs> Great that it was helpful. Take care, <laughs> Emma, as well. Thank you. Great, Brooke. Bye-bye. <laughs>